mean, this thing could have any shape it wants. It could be some big cloud. I don't know if you guys have seen much economic data, but almost all relationships are like incredibly noisy, and, and you just get nothing. And here it's like exactly perfect. So it's almost like a law of nature. What this is saying is the biggest firm is twice as big as the second biggest firm within a given industry or across industries. And this is one of the most robust facts in economics. Um, this is also true of CEO income, though the scale is one third uh, rather than uh, one. <coughs> so that, that means, some people call this the Pareto principle, which is that 20% of people control 80% of the wealth. Right? And there's always going to be something, uh, something like that. Um, this is also true for relative comparative advantage across countries. The countries that are best at something are like much better than the country that's next best. Japan is just like much better than, any, than Korea at electronics. And Korea is like much better than the next best country. And then it like dies off really, really quickly uh, from there. Um, we'll talk more about comparative advantage on Thursday. But some of the broader um, takeaways are that talent, income, and other social differences tend to be extremely large. Um, and that anything that would say that sort of like there's only so good you can get is just like totally the wrong way of thinking about things. At the top of any talent distribution, people are extremely heterogeneous. And the more you go up the distribution, the more heterogeneous people get. Um, and this is particularly true at the upper end. And the really nice thing is that these simple empirical regularities characterize things extremely well. They actually do extremely, uh, they're extremely accurate, even though they're extremely simple. Working with that mathematically, so see in your problem set, is about the simplest thing to work with mathematically that there is. It's basically, other than a linear form, it's basically the same as Cobb Douglas. It's a constant elasticity thing. So it's extremely easy, but it's extremely accurate. Um, okay. Just to give you some more of these Zips laws, this is another amazing thing. So take all the cities in the United States, take the log of their population and their log of their rank. So this again would be negative one if, this, if the first city, New York, was twice the size of LA, if LA was uh, three halves the size of Chicago, if Chicago was you know uh, four thirds the size of, what's the fourth city in the United States? Does anyone know the person? Houston, that sounds right. It's probably Houston. So, and I mean, look at that. If you ever write a thesis and you get a relationship like that, you're, you're going to get the Nobel Prize, probably. I mean, it's like, it's almost impossible to get a, a relationship like that in economic data. I mean, it's just amazing. And this is not just true for the U.S. Take all, any country in the world, and it follows this just as well. Um, this is also true for use of words in the English language. So if you take the most used word and the next most used word and so forth, and say how frequently are they used, it like works perfectly. So um, this extreme heterogeneity at the top of the distribution uh, raises some important questions. So one is that it means that rents are going to be very important even in the long run, because there's just a huge amount of heterogeneity at the top of the part of the income distribution, and the top part of the, part of the talent distribution, which determines who enters industries. And this undermines a lot of the classic financial <coughs> logic that we, we were talking about. Um, free entry, therefore, is really more of an anomaly that gets in the way of the normal functioning of markets, rather than the standard the way that markets operate. So there's some areas where it becomes really easy to copy something. And that's a problem that gets in the way of the market doing what it usually does. That's not a sort of natural, the natural thing up from which this is a deviation, right? And so intellectual property can in some ways be seen as a way of restoring the normal functioning of the market rather than impeding it. Um, in particular, because talent is so dispersed in these other areas, unless you find a way in innovation and IP to give people protection, people are going to go into the areas where their talents get paid what they 
usually get paid rather than into innovation, and that could be a real problem. Um, another natural question is if some people are really important, if they're really talented, if they're really big, they're probably not really going to act as price takers. Because the distance between them and the next person can be very large. Now, that's not necessarily the case if even the largest firm is small, it's just much bigger than the next biggest firm and so forth. But often, uh, the, the most important, the most talented person will be large relative to everybody else. Um, another thing is that uh, income distribution uh, tends to be highly unequal as a result. Because if the most talented people are just so much more talented than the next most talented people, the people at the very top are going to get a lot. And that might be a problem from a normative perspective. And, and we'll talk about that um, in the lecture on redistribution, lecture 11. And in fact, we'll use this Pareto distribution for income, which uh, shows up in the data, to try to think about uh, how much we want to redistribute what. Um, so in some sense, these concerns all coming out of the heterogeneity of talent are going to be like crucial to many of the things we're going to be discussing throughout the rest of the course. And uh, that's it. So if you guys have any questions, I'll take them. Or otherwise, I'll see you on Thursday. Yeah? Um, but like we talked about this with respect to like how one person who is yeah. the best in like their family customers. Uh, so then um, if it could be the case that the, the superstar is just incrementally better um, than the next guy. But, yes. but in terms of income, um, he would be the difference would be much larger. So yes. I'm not sure if income is an accurate measure of talent. Um, yeah, I mean that, that that's that's right. I mean he could be very very close, but it could just be that um, he can reach a lot of people because of the technology. That that's that's Sherwin Rosen's argument. Um, I think that the truth is like both things are at play. Actually, differences in talent are very large, and people can reach a lot of people. The, the, the real question in, in that context, like in pop culture, for example, I think ends up being whether people value like being listening to the same thing that other people are listening to so they can communicate about it and like have fun time talking about the latest celebrities. Or whether um, people like really value having music that they, that's like the thing that they like, or being different from other people, and that'll determine you know how big the scale that, that people reach is. So, yeah. Um, in point two, that why is strong discipline? Why why would discipline be? You no, you need um, you need to have strong dis economies of scale in order for it to be the case that you can have this big heterogeneity and not have um, and not have market power. So, so basically, if you have a, this heterogeneity and the first person is that much bigger than the second person, that person is that much bigger than the second, next person, you'd have to have very big diseconomies of scale in order to sustain a market where there's a lot of people and yet there's still these ratios lining up with one another. And so, those are often implausible, and so we're likely to end up, if we have Zip's law, with very big firms relative to the industry as a whole. Well. Great. Thanks. Remember, next.